thank you, Stuart, for the introduction and the, inv the invitation to be here. It's a pleasure to be here. And as Stuart mentioned, it's a great timing to talk about this because the system is pretty much ready to be operational in a real way. So given your expertise on making data available to end users, I would like to, to get your feedback and, and, and probably your help and opinion on how you would be able to take this over for a real-time operational um, mode. So before I talk and give detail on the Australian flammability monitoring system, I would like to put it into a bit of into a context why it is important uh, today. So um, uh, we know that the fires have been shaping our landscape since uh, thousands of years ago, but today with the climate change, the fires are getting more severe and frequent. So um, we are having uh, fire seasons that are longer than what is been normally uh, in Australia and globally. For example, here I have a, a photo of the campfires in California next year, last year, sorry, that were burning very late in the fire season. So uh, in November, in the southern hemisphere, the fire managers should be start planning the prescribed burns to reduce uh, fire hazards. But at that time, they were fighting a very uh, intense and severe fire that was very, very much not expected at all. At the same time, more or less in the southern hemisphere, we were having early fire season, uh, an early fire season. So we had, uh, in Canberra, we had in November the Pierce's Creek fire, that it was far to be a catastrophic fire, fortunately. But actually, it wasn't catastrophic because we were very lucky that the meteorological conditions changed uh, after the fire started and the fire managers were able to control the fire very efficiently and quickly because we were all very worried about what could have happened as I will show later on. So why all these fires are happening out of the what we call normal fire season? Well, as I previously mentioned, is is, there's an agreement that is all due to climate change. And what is happening is that uh, there are very concentrating high precipitation that build up a lot of fuel that then it dries very quickly um, uh, over a long time periods. So one of the common denominator of all these mega fires that are happening around the world is the dryness of the landscape, so the condition of the landscape. So what's the problem then? Are we ready for this uh, to predict and respond to these uh, mega fires? Uh, I would say that not yet. For example, in Australia, we have a, a fire in the rating system that was developed in the 60s. And it's, uh, it was developed and calibrated using around 800 experimental fires uh, across the country. But uh, none of those experimental fires were burning at, in the conditions uh, that we have fires this year, these times. So none of those equations uh, work well for extreme fire behavior conditions. And if you have a look at the, here there is a list of all the, the variables that are known to, to influence fire danger. The current fire danger rating system only consider a few of those, and they are mainly related to weather conditions. And there is only one variable that is indirectly giving you some information about the fuel availability through a drought factor. So fortunately, uh, the, there is a, uh, in 2017, all the Australian governments uh, agreed that there is a need of a new Australian fire danger rating system that will incorporate more modern science and more physical-based models, not only empirical uh, models, uh, to, to have a more comprehensive and realistic fire danger rating uh, system to be used in Australia. So the idea is to have a lot of input parameters that are related not only to the weather condition, but also to the state of the fuel, and also the capability of, of, of the fire fighters to suppress the fire. And I'm not going to go into detail, but a lot of, lot of variables. Um, uh, so the new index is going to be a, a lot more comprehensive and flexible to incorporate science as the science comes. So under this context, um, uh, we, in 2014, we got a project for the Bushfire Natural Hazard CRC, who is funding um, the research that I'm going to present today. 
to derive information about fuel condition using satellite imagery. So what do I mean by fuel condition? Basically, I mean three properties of the fuel or vegetation, if you prefer. So fuel condition refers to the structure of the fuel, the quantity and the load, and the moisture content. And these three all together determine the flammability of the landscape. So this is how likely a fire is going to ignite if you threw a mat, and for how long that fire is going to run, and how intense uh, that fire is going to be. And here I just put a few photos uh, to explain uh, why you really need to look at the three things if you really want to have a full picture of flammability. If you have a look at these two photos here, this is the same location in two different seasons, in the dry and the wet season. It is obvious that if you look into a uh, few moisture content, the fire danger of this spot is going to be higher because the vegetation is drier and therefore the, the fire is more likely to ignite in that situation. But what happens if you look into these two locations? These two photos probably have the, uh, these two places uh, have vegetation with similar moisture conditions. But if you look at the fuel arrangement in these uh, places here, there's a lot more fuel load and the structure is more compact and there is a lot of understory fuel that will make a fire starting on the ground to quickly escalate to the ground. So again, to really have a full picture of flammability, you need to account for all these uh, three properties of the fuel. So today I'm going to mainly be focused on, on moisture content, but I want you to have into mind that there is a need to integrate this with more things, as, as I, may, I will mention later on. Uh, so, so why light fuel moisture content is one of the key variables uh, determining the flammability of the fuel? This is because um, there has been a lot of research, and this is just an, an example, that so when the fuel moisture content is higher, the fire spread rate is lower. This is because the, the heat of the fire first need to be used to evaporate the water that is in the vegetation before it can move to other particles. Uh, this is are some results of uh, a work I did with my colleagues in Spain, where we also demonstrated that, uh, that the fuel moisture content uh, determined the number of fires and the total burn strength that uh, it burns in, in this was, this study was done in Spain. So as you can see here, you have the fuel moisture content values and here the number of fires that occur during a fire season. And you can see how the, there is a lot more fires when the fuel moisture content values drop below a certain threshold of fuel moisture content conditions. In terms of burn area, also the larger fires only happen when the fuel moisture content values are below certain thresholds. Uh, this time, in this occasion, it's around. 80% of moisture content conditions. So what, how can we get information about fuel moisture content? Well, uh, the more direct and accurate way to get information about the uh, fuel moisture content is using field sampling and gravimetric methods. Basically, you take some samples in the, in the field. This can be less or more challenging, depending what kind of fuel you are sampling, if you want to get Moisture content condition of the canopy of a eucalyptus tree, you need to use a kind of huge slingshot to get the branch down and get the uh, leaf samples from the tree. Um, uh, so even though this is the most direct and accurate, this uh, is not operational, uh, as you can imagine, and because uh, you are never going to get enough samples to be representative of, of a large uh, uh, landscape. So there has been uh, uh, suggestions of using meteorological indexes as a proxy of the moisture content uh, condition, given the relationship between weather and moisture conditions of the vegetation. But um, we know that the, the weather stations are sparse, and therefore you need a, a special interpolation of the weather conditions for estimating a, a few moisture content conditions in a large scale. But most importantly, in terms of uh, 
of live fuel, so living vegetation, is that uh, the meteorological indices are only very indirectly related to the live fuel moisture content conditions. And this is because uh, this fuel, this vegetation, only responds to very long-term atmospheric conditions because they are adapted to cold withdrawal. Here, for example, I show a, a figure of the fuel moisture content uh, values for three different species in, in Spain that I measured in my PhD long ago. And you can see that for a same location under the same weather, the vegetation is having a very different response. Here we have a very strong seasonality for the grasslands, but then we have a Philidae angustifolia, that is this plant here, that has very do, uh, deep roots that can access to under water that doesn't vary if you must contain at all. And then we have these two lavanifers that try to avoid uh, the drought, um, changing the angles of the leaves to about, avoid the, the evaporation uh, produced by the reflection, uh, the radiation of the sun. And therefore, there, it doesn't have a strong seasonality, but it's still you see that in summer, it is summer in the northern hemisphere, the few most content values also decrease. So again, meteorological data uh, indexes are no, are no good indicators for the fuel moisture content condition of the live fuel. So that's why uh, remote sensing uh, brings a new opportunity because it provides a direct observation of, of uh, the fuel moisture content conditions. And um, basically, and in very simple words, uh, uh, we know that the solar radiation that hits a leaf surface is either absorbed by the leaf, transmitted to other layers in the leaf, or reflected back to the sensor. No? So here uh, we have what we call the spectral response of the vegetation, where you have the reflectivity, so the energy, the solar radiation that is, uh, goes back to the sensor uh, for different wavelengths. So why can we use uh, this information to track vegetation water content because uh, if the leaves have a lot of water, uh, they absorb a lot of solar radiation in this region of the spectrum. And therefore, uh, yes, these differences in the spectra can be picked up by the sensors and, and be used to estimate fuel moisture content. There is also some variation in the, in the green that is due to an indirect effect. So when the vegetation get drier, the pigments in the leaves also decrease. That's why the leaves get brown. And therefore, uh, that can also be an indirect way to, to retrieve fuel moisture content. So the use of remote sensing for estimating fuel moisture content is nothing new. It's been around 20 years. So this is a review paper I wrote in 2013. Um, that summarize all, all the methods that have been developed around the, the world. And um, in this table that I'm not going to go into detail, of course, uh, it summarizes uh, the main methods that were available in 2013. And here I just uh, put some key messages from, from my review, is that uh, the main methods were used were either statistical or physically based models, most of them use core resolution imagery, uh, mainly uh, MODIS. And uh, most of the methods were used invisible, near infrared, and solar wave infrared information. And all the methods were derived either in the Mediterranean and temperate ecosystems in Europe. There was a bit of uh, research done in Western North America. And in Australia, there was only some publications uh, in southeastern Australia. So given that, um, that there was no a, a, a model or a method uh, to, to be applied uh, at a continental scale for Australia, we decided to develop the, the first continental scale website providing information on landscape fuel moisture content and related flammability derived from satellite observations. And the system currently uses uh, MODIS data, as you will see uh, later on. So 
a bit of theory now, how does the algorithm works uh, to retrieve a fuel moisture content. Basically, the algorithm is based on, on physics, so it uses variety transfer models to simulate different reflectance. So if you remember that reflectance uh, of the vegetation I previously show, here what I show is different simulated reflectance for different fuel moisture content. Again, so you use some physical models to simulate some scenarios of potential reflectance in different fuel moisture content conditions. So then, whenever you have an observation from the satellite for a specific location, uh, what you do, what we, the algorithm does is to compare uh, this observation with all the simulations that we have created in, that, in what we call a lookup table using a MERI function that in this case is a spectral angle. And then it selects the best case. So it selects the spectra that is more similar to, to, uh, to the observation and the corresponding fuel moisture content value that uh, was used to simulate that spectra is used as the final solution to, to the inversion of the reality transfer model. If we do this over all the pixels in an image, uh, you can get a map of fuel moisture content conditions using satellite information. So going a bit more into detail, uh, well, uh, instead of just having one look at table of simulation for all land covers, the algorithm simulates three different land covers depending on the land And this is because these land covers have very different res uh, spectral responses and the models that need to be used to simulate that reflectance uh, needs to be different. So for those that know about reality transfer model, for grassland we use pros prospect and sale, for forest we use uh, prospect and geo sale that has into account the geometry of the trees and such when it comes to simulate the reflectance. So basically, we simulate these three lookup tables. We, have, we use a land cover type uh, map uh, to, to know if for a specific pixel what's the land cover. Uh, and, and then we use that information to, to select the lookup table. And with that, we constrain the inversion of the model only uh, to do that land cover type. So we only search for the simulations in that specific lookup table, and it speeds the, project, the process. Then we, once we have the observation from MODIS, so we use that specific product. We do a quality control, of course, and then we compare the spectra, as I explained, explained, explained uh, previously, using these specific bands from MODIS and this vegetation index. We use uh, that MERI function, that is the spectra angle, and again, we find the best matching, and we get the fuel moisture content, okay? So we applied this uh, for Australia um, uh, for, uh, since 2001. That is when MODIS, uh, 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 when we have the first MODIS uh, available imagery. And we validated this with uh, data collected on the ground. So in this map, I show the location of all the, the plots we use for the validation of the retrievals. And here you can see what was measured on the field in this, what the algorithm under tree, and uh, we can see a fairly good agreement and uh, with accuracy of uh, of 40 percent, uh, that is what is regularly reported in the literature. So we were pretty happy with the results. In comparison with other methods that are for Australia, I mentioned previously that in Australia there is uh, there are, there's uh, one algorithm that was developed for only the Southeast Australia. Um, uh, our algorithm performs better for grasslands. And for shrubland and forest, uh, all the algorithms perform similarly. Perhaps Kakamo uh, performs a bit better than ours. But it's fair to say that um, the Kakamo algorithm is an empirical algorithm that was calibrated using the data that I'm using for the validation. So my expectation is that if we validate the model somewhere else, uh, the differences in the performance will be uh, higher, for better or for worse, I'm not sure. 
So now I got a simple question yes, to, for you to relax a bit. So my question is that, can you add apples and oranges? Could you? Is there any common scale you could use to add these two? I'm going to say the answer, fruits. <laughs> so of course, the, you cannot add apples and oranges unless you find a common scale in these scales in this case will be fruit. So as I previously mentioned, uh, pure mustard content is only one, com uh, one component of the flammability. So you want to have a full picture of flammability, you need to integrate pure mustard content with the structure and fuel load, for example. So what we did uh, to that end is, is try to convert the fuel mustard content values into a flammability index that ranges from zero to one that then could be integrated with other indexes into an integrated fire risk index. So the way we did that uh, was using logistic regressions and uh, uh, we use the fuel mustard, several variables derived from fuel mustard content that I will show later as independent variables. And as dependent variables, we use the fire, the fire history, the fire occurrence in Australia, uh, derived from uh, MODIS uh, satellite product. So similarly to the fuel moisture content, uh, we also calibrated different equations for different fun uh, plant functional types because they respond very differently to uh, to moisture conditions. Uh, and the variables we put uh, uh, derived from fuel moisture content was the fuel moisture content of the week before uh, the fire, uh, the difference between two periods. And with this, we wanted to know how quickly the vegetation changed because the, if there is a very quick change in vegetation, that is related to higher risk potential. And then the anomaly, so how anomalous uh, specific value was in comparison with a long time series of fuel moisture content values. Um, similarly, we also validate uh, the flammability index using the, the rock curve. Basically, uh, the closer these values to one, the better is the model. So we got a value of 0.71, that is also uh, quite good. Um, and uh, in this table, I just summarize uh, what the Australian Flammability Monitoring System uh, provides. So um, it provides information about life in most content using these algorithms that I explained. The spatial resolution is 500 meters, uh, and it provides information every four days with a latency of four days. And I will explain later on why we have this latency in the system. Then I didn't mention, but we also provide an indication of the uncertainty in the estimates, uh, what we think is very important in terms of fire management, because if a fire manager needs to make a decision that is going to affect lives, they want to know how much they can trust in a model estimate. And then uh, the flammability index. And because the flammability index is compute using uh, the fuel moisture content conditions of the weeks before the fire, the flammability index has a capability to forecast uh, the, fuel, the flammability conditions four days ahead, eight days, sorry, ahead. And finally, uh, I just briefly mentioned that the, the Australian Flammability Monitoring System also hosts uh, data from the bomb uh, on soil moisture condition. So the idea of having this data is because the soil moisture is more related to the dead fuel, so the, the little and, and the, the fuel that is on the ground dead, and therefore um, it can give a more complex picture of the moisture condition of both the dead and the live component. So how does the system work? All right, so basically uh, we have um, some reflectance produced from MODIS storage in the National Computing Infrastructure. Uh, these products come from the USGS, so we have a synchronized, uh, um, uh, we have all synchronized, so as, as soon as there is a new uh, image available, uh, it is copied uh, to the NCI. Then we compute these algorithms, I explained, to get the few most content first, then the flammability, 
we arrange this in data cubes of one year uh, for the sake of the, the size of the fruit. Then we merge this into a mosaic for Australia and we serve it uh, via threads and WMS and we have uh, the web application that can be interrogated uh, uh, by the uh, users. So it has some utility to, to interrogate the data uh, by the users uh, and we use uh, let, uh, programming language to, to add those functionalities. So this is how the flammability system website uh, looks like. Um, basically, you have uh, here an option to, to select any date uh, since 2001 to date with a latency of four days because all that process I explained before. You can search for any location using lat long or a specific address and then you will zoom in in that specific location. Here you have an option to visualize the lab fuel moisture content, the flammability index, or the soil moisture content layers that I mentioned yesterday. You have some, the option to select uh, different save files or reference. Here you have uh, the file weather areas, that's why these strange shapes are. But you can select the states and territories or the national parks or any other things. Then, of course, you have a legend that if you click in the info, it gives you information of what that variable is and gives you a reference uh, to the paper that explains more about the variables. And then you have a chart that I'll show now. So this is uh, a zoom uh, of the system to the ACT uh, the day before the Pierce's Creek fire. So I wanted to show this uh, to show actually the, the dryness of the landscape on, on that day. As you can see, there's a lot of red here. That means a lot of very low, low values all around uh, Canberra city. And uh, if we look at the, at the graph that uh, we also produced when you click in one specific pixel, you see in dark blue, you see the, uh, the conditions for the date you pick here. In this situation, it's a uh, the day before the Pierce's Creek fire in Canberra. And we also show the previous years as a reference. So as you can see, 2018 was far a lot drier than the previous years. So uh, that's why fire managers were so worried about uh, the situation and the dryness of the landscape uh, for that uh, fuel. Here I just saw uh, the same map for 2015, and you can see there is a lot more blue uh, than there was in 2018. So we are working on a new version of the website that looks slightly different, and what we have also included is the current uh, incident feed uh, for the emergency services. So now uh, when you open the website, you will be able to see all the active fires and if you click in one, you get all the information. In this case, this is a plant burned that was uh, in April, was planned in April. And uh, we think this is uh, useful because if you zoom in that plant burned, you can see the fuel most of content conditions of the fuel uh, for that specific plant burned. And, uh, and you can then decide, as I will explain later, where to allocate the, the resources to control that fire. For example, here you can see that there is an area that is a lot drier, so perhaps farm managers can decide to put, put a few more trucks in this area to keep the fire under control. The problem uh, with the system at the moment is the spatial resolution. Uh, it's 500 meters, and as you can see here, there are only a few pixels, so uh, the current resolution doesn't solve uh, fuel moisture content differentials due to topographic uh, features, for example. So that's why, as I will explain as well, we would like to move into a higher resolution version of, of the system. So how is the system currently or intended to be used? So basically the system can inform all um, fire management uh, decisions in terms of planning, preparedness, and response. So
So for planning, as I mentioned already, it can help to schedule in the, the prescribed burns. So trying to find that window uh, when the fire can, uh, with the, the burn can carry on without es uh, escaping because of uh, high fire risk. Um, so it can also be used as an indication of the potential of a canopy to score. Uh, when, you know, when the, the managers are doing prescribed burns, the, the, these burns need to be very low intensity and they cannot affect the canopy. So if the satellite in a forest is giving you a very low fuel moisture content of the canopy, you can expect that that canopy is going to escort. And therefore you may need to wait to burn it any other time. It can be used as a fuel moisture content differential uh, to act as a soft control line. Um, uh, it is planned to be used as a long-term fuel condition for the prescribed burn decision system tool that the ACT Parks is, uh, uses to plan the burns. And it can also be a component uh, for, for modeling emissions uh, that uh, it is very important when it comes to planning burns uh, uh, that needs to be planned in a way that uh, the, the, the smoke is not going to go into the cities, for example, and affect people. So in terms of preparedness, as I mentioned, the current fire danger rating system doesn't include this information. It's going to be included soon in the new fire danger rating system. But in the meantime, we think this information can be used to amend the preparedness level. For example, if for a given day, the fire danger rating system is high, and you see that the, the landscape is very dry, you can't flag that and, and, and perhaps raise the levels to extreme or very high uh, according to that potential extra uh, level of information. In terms of response, it can assist in firefighting and resource allocation. Uh, in Australia, at the moment, all the fire behavior models uh, that are operational use only the, the spin effects grass model uses fuel moisture content as a direct input into the model, so that can be used uh, operationally to, to know where the fire is going to spread when it starts. But for, for the other uh, fuel types, the fuel moisture content is not currently an, an input into the fire behavior models. But similarly to the, the um, fire, then you can use uh, this information to expect that the fire may spread quicker if the fuel moisture content is, is drier than, uh, than a certain threshold. So, um, as you all may know, most of you may know, MODIS is reaching the end of their life. It should have been, <laughs> I should have uh, died long ago, but it's still un up and running. But we expect that any day it will stop working. So we are, of course, planning for continuity of the system and um, we did a feasibility study on, on applying the, the algorithms to other satellites. These are the satellites we selected as potential good candidates, uh, both due to the temporal or the spatial resolution. So what we did uh, was to compute the algorithm uh, using all these data sets and evaluated uh, the performance using the field observations. Um, and here we, I saw the road mean square error and the R square of between the estimates and the observations on the field. And we see that indeed the algorithm performs very similarly uh, in all the satellites, what kind of demonstrate that it is uh, sensor agnostic uh, because it's, it's a physical based model. Uh, so in, in, in conclusion, it could be applied to any of these satellites. So our plan was um, first, uh, we, we tested to apply to IMAWARI-8. IMAWARI-8 is a geostationary satellite that provides information every 10 minutes. So this gives us the, the opportunity to track diurnal changes in fuel moisture content that are indeed very important for grasslands because uh, grasslands have a strong diurnal syst uh, syst um, signal, as you can see in here. This is uh, a test we did for a grassland spot in, in, in South Australia. And you can see how the fuel moisture content reaches a minimum a bit before noon and then uh, recovers 
in the afternoon. So we are also, um, we have just re uh, received extra funding from the Bush Fund Natural Hazard CRC to do a pilot version of a high resolution uh, version of the system using uh, Landsat and Sentinel-2 included in the Digital Earth uh, Australia. And the idea is to test this first in two areas, in the Australian Capital Territory and the Sydney Basin, so the, the fire, rural fire service and the ACT parts that are very engaged with our project can test it and, and see if it indeed provides uh, extra useful information for for um, more detailed planning in, in those, uh, for those, especially for those prescribed burns that are normally not too big um, uh, and therefore the 500 meters resolution imagery is probably not detailed enough uh, to give them the information they need. And I think that this may facilitate the utilization and sustainability of the Australian flammability monitoring system uh, in the longer term as using DEA and and with the potential of, of DEA uh, to take over the, the system for operational use. We are also planning the applying the algorithm at a global scale, of course using MODIS or similar uh, imagery. And uh, at the moment we have compiled a very large uh, database of field measurements of field moisture content that we are going to use to validate the algorithm at a global scale. Finally, uh, we are now working on a more comprehensive flammability index. Uh, everything I have saw, uh, the flammability index currently available only accounts for the condition of the, the moisture content, uh, but uh, we are going to incorporate other variables uh, um, that are, are determined of the flammability, like, like the soil moisture content that is related to the dead fuel some weather variables and also the total biomass that we are going to get from a product that one of our, our students have derived for Australia. So just to wrap up and summarize, uh, my take home message for you is I guess uh, that uh, we have this first Australian wide pre-operational system providing near real time estimates of life and moisture content with four days of latency and flammability prediction one week ahead at 500 meters uh, resolution, spatial resolution based on MODIS. The algorithms are sensor agnostic, uh, so it can be applied to any satellite theory, and our plans is to apply to Landsat and Sentinel-2 in the very uh, near future. We are also trying to extend the algorithms at a global scale, and we are in collaboration with the global wild, wild Fire information system, um, and I'm traveling to Rome in October to admit it to see how we could implement this in that system. And we, we really hope and, and think that uh, this information can help fire managers in the prescribed burning efforts, improve awareness of fire hazards, and pre positioning of fire fighting resources. And I think that was all I wanted to say. Uh, thank you for listening.